Hey friends, it's Ben again. <clears throat> this is a video for the vector calc class. Uh, we are taking a look at the ideas of arc length and curvature. So these are a couple of ideas that go together. If you read the section that uh, corresponds to these kinds of problems, what you'll find is that arc length, you, you can guess this, is when you have something in particular that's not a straight line and you want to find the length of that curve, we refer to that as arc length. <clears throat> Getting there is uh, something that's probably kind of intuitive, but then the actual work is hard. So the intuitive part is if you want to figure out what your distance is from one end of something to the other, if you can go ahead and figure out the speed that something is moving at each point along the curve and then add those up using the integral, then you know, you've got, hey, you've got the distance. It seems intuitive and maybe a little bit silly that uh, in order to find a distance, you're integrating speed, but speed is a derivative or it's magnitude of a derivative. So anyway, but the notion is that your arc length that you're trying to get is going to be a scalar quantity <clears throat> that's based on this vector value function. Okay. So the formula you'll see there in your textbook is that you'd write S of t is equal to the integral from zero to t, the magnitude of r prime, we have to use a dummy variable in here. So the magnitude of r prime of tau d tau, and then whatever you get out of that is your S of t. So the link for curvature has to do with a couple of other things together. So um, if you want to talk about how curvy something is, one way to measure it is to look at, uh, as you are moving around the curve, how fast that you're turning. And in order to get there, we kind of need to reparameterize the curve so that you have a constant speed. Because if you take a look at, say, just a parabola, for instance, as you come around the vertex of the parabola, and the standard parameterization has you slowing down as you go around the go around the vertex. And if you're talking about how fast you're turning, well, if you're turning slower, then I'm sorry, if you're moving slower on the curve, then you're turning slower. And it means that you don't quite get the idea then figured out in it. So, so we have to have this sort of notion of being able to reparameterize the curve. So uh, I've got a quick example for us uh, to look at. Um, and bear with me here as we get the iPad to show us the example. Now, unfortunately, the things we're working on right now are super convoluted calculations. So what I've had to do is to work them out ahead of time and then we'll talk our way through them, all right? So here, the problem we're talking about, we're going to reparameterize an R vector of T um, so that the magnitude of R vector prime of t, in other words, the speed is equal to one. And the r vector of t we're gonna start out with here is t squared t. There's an example that y'all will be working out where you're doing t, t squared, but you're not doing quite this. I, I was hoping to get this in a nice narrative form where I could surprise you with this as we worked out, but I, I just can't get it to come together, so. So taking a look here, if we're going to reparameterize it, we are going to have to be able to calculate this S of T. So you take R prime of T, since you're doing T squared T, that's just gonna be two T comma one. Super simple, right? And then uh, when you take the magnitude of that, you would get 
40 squared plus one. Oh, I guess I wrote it here, didn't I? And of course, when you want to do that in the S of T, you replace it with a tau just temporarily. And that's just because if you've got T appearing in two different places, it's really easy to get it all confused and stuff. So, so anyway, we're doing this four uh, tau squared plus one D tau. And if you're like me, you're like, I don't know what the integral of that is. Go check out Symbolab, all right? It's a website. I'm not going to try to jump in between it in between windows and show you it right now, but it's Symbolab, I think, dot com. Um, another one is Mathway. And of course, most people know about Wolfram Alpha. They're all options to try to do integrals like this. But I just turned this over to that and let it do the integration for me. And so it got for my S of T this super simple thing here, ha ha ha, of one half quantity T times the square root four T squared plus one plus one half the natural log of absolute value two T plus, holy smokes. So the reason why this is worrisome is now I need to take the inverse of that function in order to solve for T in terms of S. I can't do it, you know? I know that it is invertible, okay? The reason that I know it is invertible is the thing we are integrating is always positive. So that means the derivative of S of T is always going to be positive. And that means it's increasing. It's a one-to-one -one function. It is possible to invert it. I just can't do the formula. It's just too hard. So, um, so with regard to that, I'm going to say here that S is invertible, but sad face, I can't actually do the inverse of it. Sorry. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to beg off and we'll do a different example. This one's very, very much like the example that I've got you all doing like this. Okay. And the reason that I have that I'm doing something that's so similar is I tried a couple more examples and I kept coming up against things that like, like one of them was something I could invert, but eh, it's easy to get lost in the details. So we're just going to go ahead and do one where we can work out all the details. All right. In general, we're going to try to avoid working out all the details on such things, but you know, all right, so here we've got our r vector of t. I got the wrong thing there. We've got our r vector of t. It's got a cosine 2t, sine 2t, and t. And we're going to take an r prime of t. And of course, derivative of cosines minus sine. And you got to pull out the 2 because of the chain rule. It's pretty easy to get to do that. Then when you're taking the magnitude over here, you've got a square root. And you'll have a four and a cosine squared and a four and a sine squared. We combine those together and get a four. Four plus one is five, so you end up with just a square root of five. Yay, that means when we have to integrate this magnitude, we are just integrating the square root of five. And then plugging in the zero and the t, and you end up with root five t is equal to s. So this is a function we can easily invert and say that t is s over the square root of 5. The reason that we're doing that is that now we plug it back in and have our r vector of s. So uh, the, the font gets to be a little bit of a problem there, I suppose, because if you, um, if you take a look right here, my 5 probably looks a little bit like it's an s. So let me make that very, oh, ew, ah, sorry. Let me make that very clearly a five there. And same thing for these bits over here. Make them super clearly fives because otherwise it gets a little bit hard to read fives and S's and stuff. All right, so <clears throat> um, we have reparameterized and I claimed that the purpose for our reparameterizing was so that the magnitude of the derivative 
of the function would turn out to be just one. So uh, you can figure out that that's going to be the case from the theory because of the notion that when you take r prime of s and we think about with respect to to uh, t <coughs> sorry t and s then the chain rule will create the right things in order to make everything cancel out and it'll turn out to be one but you, we would like to see it done for real z's just once. So we take the derivative of this r prime of s, and just like before, derivative of cosine is minus sine, and we have to get the coefficient out front. Same thing for the sine. And then the s over root five, you get a one over root five. And then when we take the magnitude, we've got that square root. Remember how up here we ended up with a four plus one? Well, now we've got a four fifths because two over root five, when you square it, you get four fifths, but a four fifths plus the one fifth that comes from the one over root five at the end. So that means that we are in fact getting our speed to be equal to one throughout this, okay? So that's how we do this reparameterization portion of it. Mostly you need to see that it's possible and we need to see that we had a night, we needed to see with a nice example there that that would come out. Uh, and then I don't like to ask you to trust me, but trust me on the fact that since we always have invertible functions, we could always do this. It's just that the formula may not be nice. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so then the question is, why, why were we doing that? Well, again, we want to talk about traveling around a curve and seeing how fast that we're turning. And the way that we do that is to look at the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector to the curve at a given point. Unit tangent vector, you know what tangent means and you know what a unit vector is. So all we're going to have to do for that is take a derivative and divide by its own magnitude. Not a problem. Unit normal vector means a vector which is internally tangent to the curve and uh, has unit length. I said the wrong thing. It has to be orthogonal to the unit tangent vector. So those two vectors are perpendicular. They have to both be unit length. It has to be internally tangent or internally normal, which is to say it's pointing in the direction that the curve is pointing towards, okay? So the way that you actually do that is you figure out the unit tangent vectors function as it goes around the curve, and then you take the derivative of that, and the derivative will tell you where it's changing towards, and then you make that into a normal vector, okay? So we are going to look again with that example that we just got through looking at. Um, and we're going to do things the hard way of figuring out what the tangent vector is, the unit tangent vector is and the unit normal vector is. But we're going to do it at, um, oh, I started to say we're going to do it at just one point. We will plug in for one point, but we're going to do it in general here. All right. So sharing screen again. Then, yay, okay, it worked. All right, so with regard to this, we are again going to have that helix curve and we've already gone ahead and forced it to have a magnitude of one for the uh, R vector prime of T. And we're going to find a unit tangent and a unit normal at a particular point along the curve. You may run into one problem at some point from homework or whatever, where it says, find a unit tangent at a point and it gives you X and Y instead of giving you T. But the thing you gotta do is to look at what your equations are for X and Y, set them equal to whatever the point is and solve for T, okay? You're usually not that big of a deal, but you know, it could feel like a little bit of a hassle sometimes. 
All right. So our r prime of t, like we did before, is going to be this. And then we can make note of the fact that in the previous problem, we set it up to make r prime. There we used an s instead of a t but to, to make the magnitude of r prime be 1. And because of that, that says that the unit tangent vector, we don't have to divide by anything to fix it. Okay. I could have uh, left out the 1 over square root of 2 in here. And then we would have just had to come through the problem and divide it by the square root of 2. Not that big of a change. Okay. All right. Um, I kind of lost my place. But, uh, so if this here, this r prime of t also is t of t, the unit tangent vector, uh, then we can go ahead and find dt dt here. And that's going to help us figure out the unit normal vector. So taking that derivative, all we have to do is to just take derivatives one at a time. You have to pay attention to the chain rule. Since you pick up an extra square root of two, these one over root twos become positive one half, I'm sorry, negative one half on each of them. And then we have to figure out its magnitude because we're gonna take this and divide it by its magnitude. So the magnitude we're just taking and squaring each entry and adding up. When we do that under the square root, it's one fourth. The square root of one fourth, of course, is one half. You could probably have guessed that the one halves were going to fall out because of the nature of what we're doing. But then when we get the unit normal vector, we're dividing by one half and we have the negative of sine, oh gosh, my, I forgot a parenthesis here. So my, my uh, little bit of OCD is gonna kick in there and I'm gonna, have to put a parenthesis in. All right. So uh, once we get that figured out there, then for little t equals zero, we can just plug back in up here. And you know that the cosine of zero is one. So you end up with the one over root two. Sine of zero is zero. And one over root two, doesn't matter what t is, it's going to be one over root two. So that's your unit tangent vector. You can check and see that it's a unit vector. For this unit normal vector, we plug into sine and get zero, and we plug into cosine, and we'll get one. And of course, the minus hanging out front means it's a zero, negative one, zero. So at a certain point along this curve that's a helix shape, you will have a unit tangent vector given by this uh, formula here and a unit normal vector pointing in the direction that you are currently turning at this point along the curve given by zero negative one zero all right so uh, that gets us uh, gets us an example there of figuring out this unit normal vector unit tangent vector um, <clears throat> Yeah, we will come back here in a minute and say more about those kinds of things. But part of where we're heading towards, remember, was this curvature idea. How fast are we turning as we go around curves? So this curvature, there are multiple different formulas for how to calculate it, OK? And so I'm going to look at a couple of examples here I think it's two examples. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to have a couple, couple, actually a couple of three examples where we have curvature popping up. Okay. So the first example, um, we're going to just go ahead and figure out curvature as a function of t. And we're going to do this for a plane curve. I want to make some points about there's special things that happen for plane curves. So, Mirroring. And all right. So, uh, with regard to our uh, function here, we're going to have t comma t squared. There's an example very much like that that y'all are going to do some some work with. Okay. 
And so I am going to cheat because I want to be able to use this formula here. This formula gives us our curvature in terms of our velocity and acceleration, just the first and second derivatives. But it has a cross product in it. You can't do cross products if you just live in two dimensions. So we're going to cheat and we're going to trade in our two dimensional function for a new and improved three dimensional function, which just puts a zero into the z coordinate. Okay, just a little bit of a trick that we're going to use. It doesn't change anything about the curve, but it allows us to do our calculation. So calculating r prime of t, you just get 1 and 2t and 0. But r double prime, you'll end up with just 0, 2, 0. Then when you take the cross product of those two things, you end up with a constant. The reason it's a constant, even though one of the pieces of it is not constant, is that uh, here, when you do the x part, you've got this little determinant to take. And it's got zeros multiplied all the way through there. And then when you do this z part, um, I'm sorry, the y part, you are attaching things here that have the zeros. So that drops out. But when you do the z part, then you need to do this little determinant. You get the two from the main diagonal, but the, the transverse diagonal that has the 2t on it has a zero in the other part. So that means that the t just ends up dropping out. And we have the magnitude, or we have the uh, vector that's in the, that we'll have to take the magnitude in the top to be just 0, 2, 0. Magnitude is just 2. So that's, that's super nice. Okay. Then on the bottom, we have to take the magnitude of r prime of t, which remember is up here. And that is that nasty quantity square root of 1 plus 4t squared. So that means our function for k vector of t is actually going to turn out to be 2 over uh, that quantity 1 plus 4t squared to the 3 halves power. Uh, and that's not too terrible of a thing to look at. Um, and we will see another example here in a minute that does similar kinds of stuff with it. Okay. So if y'all feel good with that, I'm going to move on and look at another example. And this, in effect, is doing a bit of a proof. And that's what math is really about, okay, is proving large things are true instead of just doing one or two examples. So here we're going to show that every straight line has zero curvature. You should deep in your heart go, well, yeah. Straight lines are not curved, so they will, should have no curvature. But y'all will do a problem <clears throat> where you need to figure out what's the curvature of a circle with a given radius. And what you're going to find out is the curvature of a circle with a radius r is 1 over r. Okay, And <clears throat> so this is just really an example to get you going on what to do with that. First, we got to parameterize the general thing of what is a straight line going to look like. And so I did it like this, A, B, C, D, E, and F for unknowns. Uh, don't worry about the fact that we usually use E to denote 2.71828, but just, you know, play along that they're just letters standing for numbers. <clears throat> so we're going to go back to that same curvature formula, and we're going to take the derivatives and take two derivatives. Now on the top here, where we have to take that cross product, you're taking a cross product and one of the things you're producting with is producing with, yeah. Um, but one of the factors is going to be the zero vector. And that means that the result of the cross product is just going to be the zero vector. And that means that even though we have this magnitude at the bottom and we can calculate it, we're going to end up getting zero out of this. Okay, so every straight line has zero curvature. Now, when you do this for a um, uh, for a curve, I'm sorry, for a circle, go ahead and think of it as a plane curve. But because you'd like to use this formula here, 
go ahead and put in the zero in the Z entry. <clears throat> and you can work things out like this. It shouldn't be too much of a problem, okay? All right, so <clears throat> now with that sort of idea in mind that you know that for a curve at any point of it, you can figure out the curvature and you know about the curvature of <clears throat> um, uh, the curvature of circles being a constant. Now we're going to do something that's called the osculating circle. Kind of like the name of it. Um, I had, when I first encountered these years and years ago, I had to look it up and osculate means to kiss. You have a circle that's going to be internally tangent to a curve. So curving in the same direction that the curve is curving and they are tangent and at the point of tangency, they have the same curvature, okay? So uh, um, this is kind of an interesting sort of problem that brings together several different pieces all at once. And so uh, yeah, as you might guess, I, I kind of like these because of what it brings together. There we go. All right, so so graphically, this is what we're doing here. We have a curve like this, and it is the curve y equals x squared. And we're gonna take the point negative one, one on it, and we're going to produce an osculating circle, okay? So uh, with regard to that, um, what we have to do is to think at the point one, one, or negative one, one, which is the point of tangency, that uh, we're going to uh, get a vector that goes there. And then we're going to follow the unit normal vector. Normal vector has to be tangent, uh, has to be perpendicular to the tangent vector. And uh, the, uh, the radius of the circle has to be perpendicular to the tangent vector. So we're gonna follow the unit normal vector back to the center. So in order to get this, the point negative one, one is easy to do, but we have to figure out the radius of curvature and that unit normal vector. So, uh, so to figure out the curvature, we have a formula that makes use of y equals a function of x. So that formula just has you taking the second derivative take its absolute value because curvature needs to be positive. Uh, absolute value of the second derivative divided by one plus y prime squared and then the quantity to the three halves power. If you're looking at that and saying, ah, dude, I don't know what, what, what's going on with this. You know that formula earlier with the r prime and the r double prime and magnitude and stuff like that. This is all just developed straight from that. Okay. So um, so anyway, though, we're going to need to plug into that formula. And so you have to take the derivatives and then you have to plug in the point negative one. And so then here we get the curvature and the curvature at our point negative one, one is going to be two over five root five, because when you take five to the three halves power, it's five root five. So our radius is just the reciprocal of that. So we'll have five root five over two. And then we're going to take and put that back into the other piece of the problem. But we got to figure out the unit, unit normal vector in order to do that. And in doing so, we're going to see a trick that is only valid for two dimensions. In three dimensions, if you, yeah, in three dimensions, you just, you don't have this advantage. But we have a problem that's in two dimensions. So here at the point of tangency, we can figure out the unit tangent vector. What we do is to make a vector that points in the direction of the slope. Slope is rise over run, right? Since uh, our derivative there, y prime, is negative two, then that means that we'll have an x motion that's a positive one and a y motion that's a negative two. 
If you'd prefer negative one half and one or something like that, you can totally do that, okay? But that is the vector one negative two. We take its magnitude and get the square root of five. Square root of five has shown up a couple times in these problems, but you know. Anyway, so dividing there, you will have the vector one over root five comma negative two over root five. That is the unit tangent vector. Now, we need the unit normal vector, which is going like this. So to get there, we need to think about how can I make a vector which will have a dot product with the unit tangent that will turn out to be zero. And if I want to preserve the magnitude, what I can get is to swap the two entries and then change one of the signs. So here I swap one over root five and negative two over root five, so that I would have had negative two over root five comma one over root five, and either make the negative two be a positive two, or make the positive one be a negative one. The reason that I decided on the sign that I've got here is that I looked at the graph and I can see that the unit normal vector ought to be going up and to the right. Both the X and Y parts of it ought to be positive. So that's the reason why I chose to get them both positive. So that's my unit normal vector. And we would figured out our uh, radius there. So you'll take the five root five over two, multiply it by the two, root five, two over root five and the one over root five, you will end up with, after you do the arithmetic, the point four comma seven halves. And I might, I might, you might check my arithmetic on that, okay? But the point four comma seven halves is gonna be the center of the circle. And then the radius of the circle is that five root five over two. So <clears throat> that is how we get the, uh, get an equation for an osculating circle um, or a given curve. <laughs> My instincts are to say, anybody get any questions? Of course you don't because um, you aren't physically here with me. So, so what you should do instead of answering me out loud is to go to the assignment uh, in text entry and just you know say anything that you need some clarification about. I'll try to talk about such things at the beginning of class and um, yeah, I'll see you all in class. Take care.